we started off with a panel that was very different from the others. Uh, this was the only panel that mixed scholars with people who had participated in the historical process. And we chose civil rights uh, as this opening. And, and I think this was especially important because the National Endowment for the Humanities, which provided a substantial portion of the funding for the conference, has done a lot of work both with film and with written scholarship on the civil rights movement. They funded a series of films mm -hmm. that they've packaged uh, that have become actually very influential on public television. Uh, but one of the interesting things is why we decided to do this. And as I recall, that was something that from the very beginning you wanted to do was to open this not just with scholars. I think it was really important for us to recognize a couple of things. That a lot of the scholarship that has shaped this field of African American history was tied to the civil rights movement, were tied to freedom movement. So I wanted to make sure that people understood that the civil rights movement was transformative in many ways. And one of the ways was stimulating new scholarship, giving people new ways to understand the African-American experience and the American experience. But the other thing was, it was crucially important to realize that the scholars are shaped by the movement, but also those who were involved in the civil rights movement were shaped by the scholarly questions that were being raised. So we really wanted to say that it wasn't a simple either or, that this was a kind of nuanced way to understand both the civil rights movement and understand the role of scholarship in that. And it was especially interesting when we were uh, formulating that session that this was one instance where we could even find scholars who had also been participants in the historical process, that so many historians had actually been active in the civil rights movement. And so we were able to get this kind of mix, which I think ended up being especially interesting. I think it was really important for us to recognize that there were scholars who could personalize this experience, who could help people understand that the civil rights movement wasn't something distant but really something that shaped their life, they were active participants in, and it allowed scholars to suddenly ask new questions about race, about gender, about fairness. So it really, in some ways, helped to illuminate how historians change and how historians are shaped by the broader society they work in. The other thing that I thought was so important was to be able to use this conversation to broaden the definition of what the civil rights movement was, to help people understand that despite all the surveys we did that people kept saying to us when we were building the museum, um, civil rights was going to happen. Change was going to happen automatically. To be able to help people understand how this is part of a long struggle um, that wasn't a linear march to progress, but that it was a march that had sort of great starts and great stops, um, great victories and great defeats. And I think in a way, what was so exciting to me was while we focused on that post-war period, we also gave people an understanding of how this was not in isolation. And that in essence, what you hope the public got from this is what a com what, what is a commitment to change and how long it takes to help America live up to its stated ideals. And I think what worked especially well in that context was integrating a young activist into that conversation with these historians who both understood the past as historians and had participated uh, in that long process that you've just described. And I think having younger scholars, younger activists who actually helped us see where Black Lives Matter comes out of this, but where it diverges from that really helps people understand that there's not a simple path to progress. But what there is, is a lot of different ways to change America. What I want to say tonight is, uh, by way of introduction, is that while we want to give the past its due, we also want to give appropriate attention to what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now. Uh, we have an extraordinary uh, roundtable of panelists. Their bios are in your program, and maybe you've seen them on your website, so I'm not going to give extensive introductions. But suffice to say, there is a vast wealth of wisdom on this panel, both scholarly and experiential. 
uh, from uh, Terrence Roberts, who was one of the Little Rock Nine who marched into Little Rock Central High School in 1957 and made history, uh, to the youngest member of our panel, Jessica Pierce, who is a fierce and formidable organizer with the Black Youth Project 100 and has organized uh, direct actions all over this country, and we expect her to be a part of that cohort to change the world. Um, and in between, we have three extraordinarily prominent historians, Clay Carson uh, from Stanford University, uh, Sarah Evans, Professor Emerita, University of Minnesota, and Roslyn Turborg Penn, um, also Professor Emerita from Morgan State uh, University. So join me in welcoming uh, the roundtable participants. What was your entry into the movement? Tell us what was the most uh, powerful set of events, what were the circumstances under which uh, you entered into uh, the work related to the Black Freedom Movement, either as a scholar or as an activist. Some of you have written about this. Clay has written about this in uh, some of the um, work that he's done. So maybe we'll start with you, Clay. Well, for me, um, it started right here. I mean, literally right here on this street. Because um, when I was 19 years old, I came to the March on Washington. And um, that was my first demonstration. And I thought that they were all going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so the movement was a very good thing to be in. And one of the things, though, that I think puts that in context is that a few days before coming here, I had met Stokely Carmichael at a student conference. Uh, uh, then he was a senior at, at, at uh, Howard. And um, he introduced me to something that I really didn't know too much about. And so I'd like to make a distinction between what we might call the Civil Rights Movement, which kind of culminated with the March on Washington, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, with what I might call the, the freedom struggle. And what he, I remember I told him I was going to try to get to the march. And, uh, he kind of derided that. Why would you want to go to that Washington picnic when you can really join the movement? <laughs> and he started talking about what they were doing in the Deep South and in uh, the Delta of Mississippi and all of that. And I didn't have enough nerve to tell him that just going to the march was the most courageous political thing I'd done in my life. And going to these places would have been beyond that. And a few months later, I met, um, well, I didn't meet. I, I heard Bob Moses giving a talk about mm -hmm. plans for the um, Mississippi, I think it was a, a meeting in New Orleans, plans for the Mississippi summer. And again, I kind of had this sense that beyond the movement that, uh, you know, like I grew up reading in the newspaper about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and it was, um, it was in, you know, the Little Rock Nine were my heroes. You know, that was, that was the movement that I saw out there. But I think when I met Stokely and Bob Moses, I realized that there was something deeper and that they were, there were people in the movement who were not seeking civil rights legislation and would not be satisfied with civil rights bills, and understood that from their perspective, Martin Luther King was not, they were not following Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was following them, mm -hmm. that they were in the vanguard of the movement. And I think that realization has shaped everything I've done since then, because that's, that's what I tried to join. Uh, a freedom struggle. That's what my first book was about, was about that freedom struggle. Well, I have to say that my, my entry into the movement came primarily when I was an undergraduate um, at, Duke, in, at Duke University. Um, and I was a bit player on the margins. But I 
Don't downplay the My, good players. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as the biographer of Ella Baker would have to say. Um, my linkage goes way back because I'm a white Southerner. So I grew up in segregation and um, my father had preached the year before I was born, had preached a sermon criticizing um, the, the biological idea of race. Um, using Paul and Acts, God has made all men of one blood and ending the sermon with a critique of the white primary. Well, he was kicked out of that church. <laughs> and that's why I was born in the parsonage in a little bitty town on the border of Georgia and South Carolina, which was kind of Siberia. Um, I think I've always known it was about history. My mother told me sometime in early grade school, they're gonna tell you in school that Slavery was not the cause of the Civil War, but they are wrong. And I wish I could go back and ask her, how did she know that? I don't know. Um, so it's very deep, and it's coming back up again now as I think our country is again understanding how deep racism goes how embedded it is in so many of our ongoing daily relationships and structures, um, and that it's never have, never has been uh, simply about a couple of laws, but it's about um, how we live together. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then, of course, I, the, the movement, I went to the Montgomery March at the culmination of Selma, that was my, that was my first really big one. Um, and then I got involved in supporting a union at Duke because that's where the civil rights movement went. And out of my involvement in the new left and anti-war and civil rights, I got involved in the women's movement. And um, that was when I went to my first group meeting in Chicago in the fall of 67, I hadn't realized how many northern white students went to Mississippi in summer 64. I didn't even know about Mississippi. They didn't recruit down uh, white students in the South. I went to Africa that summer and had an extremely interracial experience laying bricks. But um, <laughs> so that was my, my ex Mississippi experience. Um, but at that point, mo the movement was my identity, and I feel like <clears throat> those movements together sent me to graduate school mm -hmm. to study the history of women. And I've become one of the things I am a scholar of is the ways those movements are linked together and the way civil rights movement has been a template for other social movements that are about democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, I was a student at Queens College City University, wasn't City University of New York then, it was just plain Queens College in the 60s. And as soon as we got there, there was, as soon as I got there, there was movement. And there was a little stale group called the NAACP on campus. And not many black students at Queens in those days. Uh, but I did know them who were there and recruited them and we all. So we said, you know, we really need to have a movement going, some kind of, and I don't know if we use the word movement, but we really need to become activists. We need to do something. So that's what started me going. And then as I went home and I, of course, there's no campus at the, there was no residential campus. So we, everybody went home at the end of the day. My father had been a student at NYU, but he had never talked about his early years there in the 1920s when things were not always too good. But he was there with Dorothy Height, and she was a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. And he used to say, oh yeah, Dorothy, oh yeah. <laughs> so I knew that what I was doing he understood because he had had some kind of dealing with it before. So that's what got me involved. Um, then we decided we were gonna start being activists. So our first foray was to go to Woolworths 
in support of the, uh, by this time it's 1961 maybe, mm -hmm. in support of the uh, students at uh, A&T who had gone to uh, desegregate the lunch counters at, at um, in, uh, isn't that awful, Greensboro. Greensboro. So we were going to support them. So we started boycotting the Woolworths on Fifth Avenue. Every weekend we'd go down there and we would march. And of course we got, and it was marching in front of the building. We were not sitting at the counters. Or some people did, but most of us were outside. And they got the same kind of response in New York City as the people did in North Carolina. Mm. Uh, white America was not ready for this. Mm. You know, you needed to stay in your place. So we understood this. So we rallied, we did that, we got involved. Um, by the time I was a senior, Andrew Goodman was a freshman. And I, can re I don't remember him that well, but I do know that we had started organizing students to be trained because most of these were white Jewish students from New York City, Manhattan mainly, who had not had any interaction with black people. So I said, you really need to learn to know some black people before you just march <laughs> into them. So I talked to the minister at the con black congregationalist church I belong to in St. Albans, and I said, would you mind? He said, of course. Now, Andrew. What's the rest of the sentence? Would you mind what? Having taking them, taking them in? Bringing them in and introducing them to black life. Okay. <laughs> At the time, Andrew Young and his wife were in New York and they were coming to our church. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like there was no civil rights mm -hmm. thought in, in, the, in the congregation. So they, he had to go to the deacon board. My father was on the deacon board and they agreed to let these students come in. So that's what started these Queens College students to integrate them into a community where they could learn what black life was like and realize that it wasn't that much different than their lives. And from that, that was that summer mm -hmm. of 60. And they went off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That following to, uh, to uh, Prince Edward County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. It actually started some years before. And I consider myself to have been conscripted into the Civil Rights Army on December 3rd, 1941. As I came charging out of the womb, I realized <laughs> this was not the place that I had anticipated. <laughs> so it took a while. I had to acquire certain skills. I had to learn how to speak. And, <laughs> eventually, eventually, I figured it out. In Little Rock, at the all-black high school, of which there was one, Negro history, as it was termed then, was a required course. Mm -hmm. I had heard about it even before I got there, but it intrigued me, and I began to find out, and I had to do this on my own because a lot of people I wanted to ask questions to were reluctant. Don't bring that up. Don't mm -hmm. cause trouble. I always was well, very curious about that re response, don't cause trouble, because according to my estimate, the trouble was there before <laughs> I arrived. But at any rate, I figured out that we were now, because in 1941, we actually were living under the aegis of the Plessy decision. See, the Plessy decision of 1896 didn't start anything. It was simply a codification of what had gone on before for hundreds of years. And all this information is just, I'm taking it in like a sponge. And then, as a 13-year-old, in 1954, when the court ruled in the Brown case, now here's an irony. In 1896, the Supreme Court said that it was constitutional to discriminate based on racial group membership. And yet, in 1954, this same court rules that it is no longer constitutional. I'm concerned about that. And maybe that's a question for some of you to deal with. For me, it was exciting, though. Because the law was now on my side. I realized this. And my first thought was, I have got to model law-abiding behavior. So by volunteering to go to Central High School was an opportunity for me to model for others what was proper in this so-called law-abiding society, fiction or not. But in any case, 
We were more than nine initially. We were probably 150 strong. We all went home on the day of making this decision to volunteer and informed our parents, at which time those numbers dwindled very quickly mm -hmm. because of the great fear. There were rumors that if any of us decided to follow through with this, there would be blood flowing in the streets of Little Rock. And a lot of parents were not anxious to allow their kids to go. Now, the parents of the nine of us were a bit different. And I think my own parents, I came home and told them I had volunteered. They responded by saying, we will support your decision 100%. And if you get up there and it's too hot and you want to quit, we will support your decision to quit 100%. So later on, I figured out I had the best of all worlds. I could stay there or leave without fear of losing one iota of parental esteem. That was wonderful. <laughs> in fact, I used that in order to keep going day after day because life was not pleasant, to put it very mildly, at Central High School. We were there, the nine of us, for one year. At the end of that year, the governor stepped in to close the schools. And most of you probably know this part of the story, too. Yeah. Orville Faubus, oh. one of that pantheon, including Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's his face? Maddox. Yes, Lester. Lester. Lester, Lester Maddox. <laughs> Lester oh, yes. Polax Maddox. And, of course, our good friend George. Well, all of them. And, but Faubus, he'd agonize over this whole thing. He didn't want black kids in the school because, in his mind, it was a white institution. During that summer of 58, between the start of the next school year, he came up with this brilliant idea to close all high schools in Little Rock which he did as a ploy to keep black kids out, but the man wasn't bright enough to figure out that if you close the schools to keep the black kids out, you keep the white kids out too. I now consider myself still an active soldier in this ongoing movement, and I don't see any end to it, unfortunately. Then I went to college. So the first person um, in my family to go to college, and I thought that, you know, I was prepared for college. I watched school days. I watched Goodwill Hunting. I'd done all the research. <laughs> I love it. I was like, I'm ready for these, like, amazing discussions that are going to happen and sat in rooms uh, with people who said that people that committed crimes were trash, and they didn't want to be, you know, dealing with those type of people in their lives. And... I was trying to be a lawyer because I thought that's what you were supposed to do when you went to college. You had to be a doctor or a lawyer or like an engineer. So I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I was frustrated and I was angry most of the time. And I had a professor that stopped me and said, Jessica, you don't want to be a lawyer. You care about justice. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, care, you care about people and what's right for people. Uh, so you don't want to be a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> So I then uh, focused on organizing campaigns uh, and actually started with labor campaigns. Uh, worked on my first campaign to kick Sodexo out of my dining hall on campus. Mm. Um, and so oh. we kicked them out, uh, ended a multi-million dollar campaign, brought all the dining hall services in-house, and then worked to unionize the, the workers with the local of AFSCME over the next year. Uh, and so for me, I was like, wow, this is real work that actually impacts real people, and this is what I'm supposed to do. And so it was at that point that I made kind of a transition from just an awareness of my blackness to actually action, because awareness absent action isn't really helpful. Um, and I've been professionally doing that type of work. I worked with the NAACP, um, because I was like, I care about black people, that's where you go. You go to the NAACP, here, you know? Uh, ended up at the, Kathy Cohen put together the meeting, uh, first meeting of BYP 100. We didn't know where we were at the time. You know, we tell the story as if it was super professional and planned. Um, but we're in this meeting, it's like 100 random young black people. They put us in these like limos, and we're going to this secret location. I'm like, where are we going? They're gonna kill us. That's what I'm telling you, they're gonna kill us. They found us all, they're gonna kill us. And, you know, so I'm trying to stay on my phone, like, I don't know where we're going. And, we get there, um, and it just so happened that at the end of the second day we were meeting was the, the day that the verdict came out in the Zimmerman trial. Mm. Mm. And in that moment, you know, we were supposed to be answering the question of if we needed an organization to represent black young people in this mm. country, and if so, what would that look like? Um, and in that moment, we began to answer the question that we were set to answer in discussions through action. So, you know, we had people that took to the streets of Chicago and were literally organizing with folks on the south side. Uh, we had people who started creating a public statement 
um, about what black young people really needed. We had people who started talking about, well, what do we do around policy? We had folks uh, who wanted to cry, who wanted to laugh, who wanted to yell, who wanted to talk about the fact that black people never have a space to heal. Uh, you know, we had in that moment in an organization and literally overnight became Black Youth Project 100. Um, so that's really how mm -hmm. I've charted my path mm -hmm. to this moment. Now, what word do you think captures an important theme in the black freedom struggle over the past half century, right? Or now, I mean, a word that you feel um, is an important one for us to wrestle with as we try to understand this moment, how we arrived at this moment over the last half century. I would say struggle, um, but to put it into context. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just one word. Please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, well, what I, what I mean by that is <laughs> that I've been carrying on this long argument about using some term other than civil rights movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because for my students, if, if you say the word civil rights or the phrase civil rights movement, it automatically, back in civil rights days, mm -hmm. it's something that happened in the past that doesn't have very much to do. Mm -hmm. And so... Throughout my career, I think I've been trying to find a way of describing something, you know, a, a freedom struggle that's ongoing. Okay. Why did you say blackness? That's what it's about, to me. That's what the movement was about. That's what our discussions should be about. But I see it, as we said it, that all these connect all these words connect, mm -hmm. and they form puzzle pieces, or pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to construct. Mm -hmm. And you say blackness um, in terms of embrace, in the way that Jessica talked about it, embracing one's blackness in a sort of white supremacist culture? It could be culture. That. It could be however you feel blackness impacts you. Mm -hmm. um, to me, blackness is what's the important part of the women's movement, because I could not see myself in the early days of the women's movement mm -hmm. uh, until I added the black part to it. So the black woman's movement, I thought, was significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since I could only use one word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering about the notion that um, I think you put it the struggle is about blackness. Uh, and one of the things that just came to my mind as I was hearing you say that was King's last book, um, Where Do We Go From Here? Mm -hmm. And I remember, I think it was Bob Moses who, who you know, commented on that and said, the, the problem with that question is, who are we? Mm -hmm. Who is the relevant we? Right. And, you, and you have to answer that question before you know where are you going. You're going. And, and I think to some degree we got too wrapped up in the question of what is blackness because it became not just descriptive but proscriptive. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the blacker than thou kind of attitude, which I think was a very divisive thing um, also in, in the 1960s as, as opposed to uh, the way the black consciousness movement was meant to be a source of inspiration to carry on the struggle. Instead, it became a source of division within the struggle. And, and I think that, um, you know, that that's perhaps one of the things that we haven't really resolved. And it goes beyond the black community if we are going to change the world, who are we going to change it with? Mm -hmm. yeah. who, who are the relevant allies? Who are, who are the people we are trying to um, work with and work against? It was definitely progress with a heavy, bold, underline, italic, and question mark after. Um, I started in this work as an organizer, um, but now pretty much focus more on systems, infrastructures, trainings, capacity building uh, for movement for black lives work. 
Uh, and so I do a lot of data work. That's a, the majority of the work that I did uh, when I was at the NAACP. And um, I just want to give a couple statistics and then kind of explain as to why I did progress. Uh, so uh, right now, just very basically, if you look at like population growth, right? And so like, and all these sources are like government sources. I want to be clear that I'm not quoting some random, you know, blog that like my best friend wrote. Because uh, I always get that question: Where did you get that from the the Census Bureau? Um, so black population right now, we're about 13.2 percent of the population. They did uh, 2060 population uh, growth projections. So right now, black people 13.2 percent of the population. 2060, 2060, we will be about 14.3% of the population. It's a 40, 40, about a 42% population growth uh, increase. Uh, the only demographic that is lower than that, is people of color, uh, is Native Americans at 41.7%. Uh, we have uh, Pacific Islanders, Native uh, Pacific Islanders at 62%. Mm. Latinos at 114%. Surprise. And Asian Americans at 128 percent. So it's the 128 percent is a population increase, increase. by that's 2060. That's surprising. Right. So that's just the base framework of what we are in existence with growth, right? But then we know that in terms of life expectancy, black people have the lowest life expectancy. Uh, we know that when we look uh, at any issue, we could look at unemployment, right? We know that unemployment for black people is about twice what it is for white people, right? Black, black unemployment is at 11.4%. We look at unemployment statistics for last year, it pretty much was stagnant or went down for most communities. It went up for young black people over the summer of last year. Uh, black trans people report an income of their households at of about $10,000. 26% uh, of black people live in poverty right now. I think the scariest piece of that for me uh, is that 46% of black children under the age of six live in poverty. Mm -hmm. We look at health. You know, we know that more white women will get any form of cancer, but more black women will die from every form of cancer. We know more black men will get every form of cancer, but more black men will die from every form of cancer. We know that the deadliest hate crime in the past 75 years targeting black people was last year in Charleston. Mm -hmm. We know we're, we're at the point right now where statistically and mathematically, it actually makes sense for us to start comparing police shootings and deaths of black people to lynching. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's where we're at right now. We know the statistics in 2014 was the black person was getting killed every 28 hours. If we updated that for 2015, it was every 23 hours. And we say progress and we say improvements. But when I look at the numbers and I hear the stories and I see what's going on, I say progress towards what and on whose scale and for who and for, for what. Mm -hmm. uh, progress was then a system that's built in anti-blackness and built on the black, backs of black people doesn't really make sense for me. Um, and I think for us, uh, the progress that we see when we see that without a question mark and with an exclamation point is in looking at what has happened in the past, the work that has happened, the strategies that were implemented, the conversations that were had, and using that to then redefine what progress looks like for us outside of these systems. Mm. Um, so for me, I, it's progress. So it's really to problematize the notion of progress yeah. and mm -hmm. to say oh, yeah. we have to redefine it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I landed there because it seemed to me that um, while I love uh, Clay's word because struggle is always there, always there, um, it's when the grassroots are mobilized, and mobilized is maybe another word, um, that the movement becomes really powerful. And you know, I feel like I'm mostly a witness, but I grew up in segregation. And I spent time, I, when I, before I retired, spent, but even since then, particularly since Ferguson, I found myself giving talks as, wherever I can about the deep, long history of racism because people either don't know or I would say we're a society that's really good at forgetting. Mm -hmm. Um, but I grew up in a world that believed it couldn't change. And I witnessed a revolution. And everything you say is totally true. That revolution is so incomplete 
that it's actually um, scary. But the, there are pieces of it that, you know, you were there at, <laughs> as it was happening um, that did get defeated. And it was the scale of the movement um, in part. It was the fact that the people at the bottom began to believe that change was possible. It isn't that. And that they could take a risk because people did put their lives, their jobs, their families, everything on the line to get involved. But isn't that the, the dilemma, though, is that I think the, the success of the struggle was to destroy the legal structures of Jim Crow. Right. And, and I think in a broader sense, we got citizenship rights at the same time, the rest of the world. You know, I, I, one of the things that happened sometime during the 60s, getting into statistics, is that for the first time, the majority of humanity were citizens of the country where they happened to be. Oh, yeah, because and colonialism was that's, crumbling that's all right. over the world. That's why I went to Africa but, to but, see uh, that But happen. my point is not, not so optimistic about that, because I think well. that part of what didn't happen Right. was that human rights didn't happen. Right. I mean, if you look at what has happened since, is if anything, we've gone backwards with respect to human rights. And I think that that's one of the things that we became very complacent about with respect to gaining citizenship rights. And I, I think that that's the thing for us, too, is that we have to get to the point where we're comfortable complicating the conversations and the strategies yes. um, and our existences that we have, um, and even just the narratives. You know, it's, you know, BYP 100, we do black liberation work through a queer feminist lens, right? And so most of the conversations I have are about what that means. And so usually I start talking about things like, um, you know, looking at the LGBTQ movement and the fact that the narrative that's oversimplified is, oh, marriage equality. Well, how far does marriage equality get you when you can't go to the bathroom in North Carolina? And, you know, it's like, so do you tell me what's more important in this moment? The fact that I'm, now women are getting stopped in bathrooms in North Carolina being questioned and being harassed physically because they're just trying to go to the bathroom. But I have my marriage license and I'm married to my partner, right? Or we look at economic justice issues and we want to boil it down to wage disparity issues between women and men without understanding that people don't have paid sick leave days and need to take days off to take care of their children because at this point, childcare is more expensive than rent for most people. And if their child is sick, they don't have the luxury of being able to put their children somewhere else, right? So we simplify these narratives and we simplify the movements and we simplify blackness for the comfort and sake um, I think of people when they sit at the dinner table instead of understanding that we actually have to do the opposite. Like we have to have complicated conversations. We have to talk about economic justice and identity politics and race. You know, it's, when I go into a room, I'm never just one thing. I would love to just walk in a room and just be like, I'm just gonna be Jessica today. I'm not gonna be black. I'm not gonna be young, I'm not gonna be queer, I'm not gonna be any of these things, but you know what, every single time I walk into the room, I have to carry all of those identities with me. So for you to ask me to sit at a table and not address every single aspect of those issues and talk about how it impacts me every single day is negligent of who I am as a person. It's negligent of our communities and how they experience things. Um, you know, and they experience things differently. When we're talking about economic justice issues, it is different if you are a black woman. You know, it is different if you are a black trans person. Um, and so you have to incorporate that into the conversation, which is a lot of also what we put behind Say Her Name. And I, uh, today is our National Day of Action. I would definitely encourage folks to, you know, if you're on Twitter and you're on social media or just even on Google, just to uh, look up the hashtag Say Her Name. Because what that is, is it's a day of action to say her name because you don't know those names. Can I it, say something? Yeah. I think we have to remember the young people who are coming up, like through elementary school. I'm not talking about teenagers. Mm -hmm. And the way they perceive not only children of color, but children who, who are white as well. They, especially since we're now in a, almost a semi-integrated, you know, a lot of communities have schools that include black and white and Asian children, Latino children too. 
community where I live is like that, mm -hmm. in Columbia, Maryland. And I raised this question because years ago when my daughter was in maybe second grade, somebody called her black. She said, well, you know you're black. And she came home and she said, mommy, why did she call me black? Now she didn't, she wasn't angry. She was just confused. She didn't, she said, I don't, she looked at her hand and she said, I'm not black. I said, black is a color, but it has more meaning than just a color. She said, okay. <laughs> and I said, so she, she got that, but she, she still didn't understand what we were saying. I said, now, and I don't know how I got it out, but I, what I managed to tell her was, some people identify themselves as black, not because they are literally black in color, but that their worldview is about people who are considered black by the larger community. Black is a political color. Yes, I didn't say that, but, but she finally got to that. And it was very interesting how that was an educational point in her life. Uh, that has meaning still. And I think this is something we need to focus on, too, is how we're going to translate the quote-unquote movement of the past and the movement of now, because there's a movement now, mm -hmm. uh, so that very young people will understand it enough so when they reach teenage, they don't have to be educated about it. I actually I th think these last few comments... Um Tell us why we're here, because in a sense, uh, one of the things we have to look at in terms of being a historian and being a museum is how do you decide what belongs inside it? Mm. What belongs inside our books? And is there a reason that this is not called the American History Museum? Mm. Because, in a sense, if we told the correct story, yeah, we'd be mm. there wouldn't be a need for a partial, a right. part of the story. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but I think the the question of myth, I, I meant that in the sense that we all are in the business as historians of creating myths. We're we're creating stories that are we hope are accurate in the sense that we've got our footnotes right, but we know are selective in terms of what our narrative is and what importance we place on certain events rather than others and, and why it's important at all. So, so I think when we look at, here we are, going to have a museum of African American life, well, history and culture, and I'm going to be really interested in the number of mythological things that are going to go into that museum. I, I hope that everything is, uh, has a provenance that, you know, that we can trace, and, and, and they're, they are actually artifacts from, and we, we kind of trust the curators to do that, but I think as we walk through it, we have to ask ourselves, what story are we telling? Because that story of the past is telling us something about our future. Absolutely. Sarah. Right. Um, I want to say amen to that. Um, because the, the history is that our job in some ways is to keep on complicating the story. Um, every time it gets simplified and mythologized, and I agree that's not always bad. But some histories are empowering, and some the message is, you could never do that. You could never do mm -hmm. that. And we have to be about the business of creating histories that say, you can do that. Because people like you have done that, and we all have shoulders to stand on. Lots and lots and lots of shoulders. Not just giants 
who we can't imagine ourselves being like. That's our job. Thank you. Jessica. Uh, yeah, so I think, I guess being, an, I'm not a historian, if anyone was confused. <laughs> a history maker. <laughs> I'm an organizer. But you're um, making history. Well, there were several <laughs> questions. You're yeah, do yeah. Whatever so you want, your closing the, remarks. The one in all this is that um, there is something dangerous, I think, inherently about just telling the truth um, and telling the real stories of what happens. Um, I think even just the question um, that was asked about um, since you're being attacked because you're a Muslim. And I think a part of that's because there's been a popular narrative that has been put out that tries to create the face of terrorism and then to associate that with a Muslim identity. When the reality of the situation right now is the, the most terrorist representative right now, um, love y'all, is white men right now mm. in this country. Um, and it's not, it's white Christian men who are working class. Those have been the people that have targeted us the most violently, right? You know, but that's not a narrative that fits the popular narrative. Mm -hmm. um, the narrative of Claudette Colvin was not a narrative that fit a popular narrative. It is not, the popular narrative is to, again, talk about black men and show faces of black men being lynched because Black women are fragile because black women, you know, because that's not the role that we take. There's a reason why we can talk about Mike Brown and Eric Garner, and those are the stories that continue to have play in the news because then people want to talk about, well, Mike Brown was a criminal, or he did this, or here's what he did to get killed. Or they want to talk about Eric Garner and how he's confrontational in the conversation, right? Um, but I, we, we don't hear about Tamir Rice in the same way, right? It's because what is confrontational about a child playing on a playground? Um, we don't hear about Ayanna Davis because what is confrontational about a young black girl sleeping in her grandmother's house um, and getting killed in front of her grandmother, right? Um, that is not something that supports the popular narrative. It is not something that supports the current power structure and the power dynamics, and that's why that's not going to be the narrative that's told, and that's why we have Say Her Name. It's not just because we don't hear the stories, it's because we are inherently telling narratives that take power away from the people. And a part of the work of what we're doing is trying to create narratives and stories and campaigns and organizing infrastructure that represents the narrative of the power, and the power relies in us. Um, and we have to be the people that retell those stories. You know, and that's literally why, even when I do trainings, I always retell the story of Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks, not just because of Claudette Colvin and the fact that she didn't represent re respectability, but because people neglect to understand there was an entire organizing infrastructure that went into building that movement. They targeted the buses because it was the only place that black people had more economic power. It wasn't just an identity issue, it was an economic campaign. There were organizing infrastructure and meetings that had happened across other cities. There was work that had happened. But that is way too powerful for us to tell other people. And so part, that is my interest in this moment, no matter what, is making people inherently aware of the own power that we each carry, building that power for, and then actually alternating um, and altering the power dynamics, right? Changing the system, abolishing the systems eventually. Thank you. Building something better. Bravo. I have a suggestion for historians, whether you're lay or professional, to look for the untold stories. And there are a lot of them out there that you might not even think are relevant. And research them and build upon them and see how they fit within the flow of the movements. And there are multi-movements. There's not just one, there wasn't just one civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. When I started writing this, I was talking, I was bringing in 19th century ones. There were 19th century civil rights movements, many of which focused on women's organizations. Look for those. Um, we might know about Prince Hall, and his attempt to get the schools of Massachusetts integrated in the 19th century. But we don't know about the women who followed and said, yeah, but you gotta put women in the schools too. So you've got to do a little more if we're going to meet the goals that we've already talked about. There's stuff out there that people have not connected to uh -huh. the whole idea of civil rights. Uh -huh. And I think that's something all of you should be thinking about. Thank you. I'll, mm -hmm. 
we're over time, so I'm not going to um, stretch it out. We have to be out of this. I do want to, um, I neglected earlier to thank our two bloggers, um, uh, Ray Arsenault of the University of South Florida and Allison Miller uh, of the American Historical Association, both of whom within 24 hours are going to be blogging up a storm about all of the issues that we raised and all of the questions that were uh, posed and maybe not fully answered because of the limits of time um, and other things. Um, I would just add on this question of the role of historians is, you know, one of the um, worst things you can call a historian is presentist, right? Uh, but, but in some ways, I do think, like everyone else, we have to be accountable for our work. Um, many of us love the subjects that we, that we write about, right? But we love them enough to tell our understanding of the truth about them. Um, but I also think we have to be in dialogue beyond um, our academic communities. We have to be engaged with people who will um, do something with the history beyond simply sit with it, right? That people right. will build upon it. The, the, the difficult lessons as well as um, the sort of heroic narratives because also with the grassroots, you know, celebration of grassroots power and all of that is also we see a populist movement right now which is relying on grassroots organizing which is very, very scary to me and really betrays many of the best values uh, of the black freedom and civil rights movements. And so we have to be careful about the heroic narratives in the same way uh, mm -hmm. that we want to be fair to, uh, to people who are often left out of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have some really interesting and provocative conversations in these next couple of days. Hopefully this has started us off um, and, and launched those conversations uh, in a way that will be fruitful uh, going forward. And I thank all of you for coming out tonight. And again, thank the organizers and thank this absolutely wonderful panel.